Following the Battle of Fredericksburg, Union morale had plummeted. As the Union soldiers headed home in defeat, more unsettling news had surfaced. General Lee of the Confederate Army had sent a group of soldiers to destroy the Union's weapons base in Remington, Virginia. What would follow would become one of the greatest spectacles of any war, a battle that to this date has been covered up due to its sheer madness. That battle was one of blood, carnage, and snowmen. President Lincoln confided in General Ambrose Burnside to lead a winter campaign against the Confederate capital, Richmond, by way of Fredericksburg. When that failed, Burnside was forced to retreat and head north to Remington to rest and refurbish weapons. Little did Burnside know that Lee had an army waiting. Well, General Burnside got back to Remington and saw that all the cannons and muskets were gone. Well, Burnside was said to have been so hopping mad, but upon looking outside the window, his face lit up. And when asked by a fellow officer what was going through his mind, Burnside replied, Snow, my friend. Snow. A fresh blanket of snow was waiting for us in Remington today. I had no idea that our great general would have us playing in it by dusk. Captain Elijah D. Taft. Burnside called a meeting of his top officers after word arrived that Confederate troops were forming a barricade around the city of Remington. Burnside drew up a set of plans that involved making snow bunkers, snowmen that could be used as decoys, and of course, snowballs for use as weapons. This is the only snowball in existence from the Battle of Remington. It's, uh, its value is unimaginable. It was, um, initially cry cryogenically frozen until uh, until the icebox was originally formed. It was uh, made by a young man by the name of Oliver Wendell Holmes. And, uh, oh boy, I had to put that down. <laughs> oh. It's, it's uh, a special snowball. Burnside called for the production of five different types of snowballs to be made by evening. Top officers got to work trying to devise prototypes that would please the general. My darling Clementine, all seems lost. Our rigorous search for the perfect snowball seems endless. I fear the worst, that our snowball will never meet Burnside's approval. Private Patrick Fitzgerald. The production of snowballs was marred with confusion and anger. When Officer Patrick Michaels was asked to create a snowball, he angrily muttered to Burnside, I'm from the South, damn it. What do I know of snow? Burnside immediately had Michaels detained in fear that he was a spy for the Confederates. Michaels later argued that he meant he was from the southern part of the North, also known as the Midwest. That evening, Officer Patrick Michaels became the first soldier to be snowballed to death. When my chief officer and I were working on our snowball, we couldn't really think of anything different that would make our snowball better than the other four. We decided to go near the river and try to find some better packing snow. As we were about to leave, my officer fell in the river. Tried as I might, I couldn't fish him out without falling in myself. When I thought that I had lost him, his arm popped out of the river. In his hand, glistening like a crystal, beckoning to me, was a snowball. I grabbed the snowball from my officer's frozen hand and felt the weight of this rock-hard ice ball. His hand quickly descended back into the watery grave, but it was not in vain. I had just received the Union's Excalibur. Private Scott May. Burnside was quite impressed by Private Scott May's ice ball and called for some 100,000 to be manufactured by morning by the artillery division. Meanwhile, the 1st and 2nd Brigades would start work on making snowmen. When the Confederates storm the city, we'll be waiting, ice balls in hand. They may have taken our guns, but they can never take our snow. <laughs> no, snow is our ally. General Ambrose Burnside. On the morning of December 17, 1862, a strong fog covered the city of Remington. A rooster crowed, as if to warn the Union soldiers that a new day was at hand. It was on this fateful morning the Confederate Army attacked Remington. At 8.30 a.m., the first ice ball was thrown. Initial casualties were high at first, 
as the Confederates clearly had the upper hand. When I crossed over into Remington, I noticed a line of men in the distance who seemed to be casually standing there. I laughed heartily at the buffoons who seemed oblivious to our whereabouts. We fired, but no men fell. Again we fired, and still no one fell. Who were these men? As one of my comrades turned to run away from the indestructible machines, as he called them, I became overwhelmed by fear. We marched closer, and I noticed that these men were just snowmen dressed in Union clothes. At that moment, I realized that I was the buffoon, Captain David Lang. The Union soldiers held their positions in the snow bunkers that were so craftily made the previous night. When the Confederate Army seemed to have exhausted its artillery, Burnside gave the order, and thousands of ice balls sailed through the air. It was the last sight many of those Confederate soldiers ever saw. Now, when an ice ball is thrown at 25 miles per hour, there are some serious implications which can happen. Brain damage and collapsed lungs. Uh, you want to go outside? I can show you. That would be a good way for me to show you. This will be about, about 25 miles per hour. Now, now, see, 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 th this has already started bruising. Th 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 uh, now, this could also be a very, very, very bad um, cut. This will be approximately uh, 50 miles per hour. Confederate soldiers were taken by complete surprise as the Union soldiers hurled ice ball after ice ball. Then something happened that hurt the Union in their time of glory. The fog had almost completely lifted and the sun was shining bright. Too bright, some would say, for the packing snow that had been working so well for the Union. The drift had turned for Burnside and his soldiers and things didn't seem to be getting any better. Casualties grew as Lee yelled for his army to charge. As they did, a few remaining snowballs sailed through the air. Then, in a sudden turn of events, a Confederate regiment attacked the bunkers from behind. Burnside went ballistic. Well, at that point, uh, General Burnside grabbed two ice balls and charged. Now, the rest of his men looked on in disbelief. I believe one shot was fired which hit General Burnside in the arm and then somehow ricocheted downward and lodged itself in his leg. Well, you could see the fire in his men's eyes and it wouldn't even yell out his name and that's when the federal officers took over. Captain Daniel Mann called for the Union soldiers to charge and charge they did. Many of them grabbed their bayonets some grabbed ice balls, and some took nothing at all. Musket in hand, I charged that federal base. One man confronted me, threw a snowball, and then stood there frightened. He tried to call time out, but I told him that you couldn't do that in war. Even though I shot him, I still feel kind of bad about not honoring his time out. Private Chester Silverfield. The fighting was dominated by the Union soldiers, who drew their energy from their fallen general. Then Lee did the unimaginable, calling for the retreat of his soldiers. The Federal infantry let loose a spontaneous Yankee cheer. Well, as it turns out, uh, General Burnside was fine. He just needed to be stitched up a bit. While he was resting, he did tell fellow officers that the Confederate Army had a snowball's chance in hell of winning the war. Well, the rest of his officers just laughed, but he had just coined a new term. <laughs> well, some of the greatest snowballs of all time were made, uh, and ice balls were made during the Battle of Remington. Um, they are what? Uh, Many like, uh, like this one. It is now 
140 years later, and the Battle of Remington is finally getting the recognition it deserves. On this day 140 years ago, soldiers of the North and South fought a gallant fight in the harshest conditions. In association with the Remington reenactors and the Geriatric Gun Union of America, we bring you that battle in all its glory. And so ends another chapter in our history. The brave souls who fought on that fateful day can forever rest in peace, for they did not die in vain, but rather they died for their country, be it by bullet, by sword, or by snow. <laughs>